What type of feedback are you getting on the proposition of your fund where Bitcoin is a core asset? So the, the official statements, whenever I do a presentation, doesn't matter what kind of potential client or, or public or, or, or listeners, the concept of my whole scarce investing team is never laughed at, for example. So this is, this is rubbish. This doesn't make sense. And then you get the first thing is the official responses. Yes, but custody, cost, career things. How do we, should we do that? The need to implement feels like it's very, very low. All right, Jeroen Blokland, welcome to Bitcoin for Millennials. Yes, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks so much for coming on. We are Dutchies, but we are doing this in English, of, of yeah, course. With um, our accents. <laughs> yes, <laughs> sometimes I get I get these comments on YouTube where people are like, you are obviously Dutch. I'm like, yeah, yeah, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, man, me too. <laughs> yeah. I'm as trying. long as I'm the trying. message gets across, uh, who cares? Uh, exactly. Yeah. I think we had a prime minister who had a way worse accent than than us two, and and he managed to, uh, well, get a job at the United Nations. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I think we'll I think we'll be fine. Yeah, I, I wanted to start with, you know, you, you are a seasoned investor with over 20 years of, of, of experience. And I wanted to ask you how your career in traditional finance influenced your personal approach to studying Bitcoin. Oh, well, I think these two for a very long time, very separate. So the thing is that the first time I did something with Bitcoin was in 2013. A lot of people are surprised and I tell them that. And that, that was obvious, obviously not because I thought that this would become so large or, or so such a, such a, well, an, an, an actual part of the investment universe. I think we can say that by now. But I, I am always of the idea that if you want to say something about that or you want to have an opinion on something, you have to experience it. Eh? So, so in 2013, I was one of these guys having all these wallet things and then losing it and not understanding it. And, and uh, so, so that was the first time I, I was just curious. What is it? Why is it so different? Why does it have to be such a hassle? Um, and I d did not think of it as an investment uh, yet. And then, of course, I spent most of my uh, investment career at, at Rubico, the, the largest independent asset manager of the Netherlands. And my primary uh, task was managing multi-asset portfolios. And, and I think since there are only six, seven, or maybe 10, depends on how you define it, the, the number of asset classes is limited. So if there is potentially a new asset class entering the universe, that's great because you only have what I said, eight, nine, 10, perhaps, and that's it. So, so that was the, the, let's say the first actual part that I said to my colleagues, uh, we have to write about this once, not, not with the idea that we should invest it in it, but to say nothing about it while it develops. So my first article on Bitcoin was actually, is this an asset class? And then by looking at the traditional characteristics like risk, return, liquidity, size. So, so I think from a professional perspective, that was basically the first official outing uh, by me. Of course, behind the scenes, I did some more research, but yeah, that, yeah. that's how these two things got together um, uh, at some point. And so do you remember when you had like this turning point where you really recognized, you know, there's, there's potential in Bitcoin to be a legitimate asset? You know, if you, when you find it in the beginning, I, I had to think of also myself when I was looking at like the, the block explorer, I was looking at like the transactions. I was like, what is yeah. this? Like it felt like I was looking at the matrix, you know, like uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, made no sense. But yeah, wh what was your turning point? I think again, two things. The first is I'm pragmatist, as they call it. So. Whenever some investment asset has the characteristic of being a separate asset class, and that, for example, means that your correlation with other asset classes is, is, is low or zero. And of course, you have to be able to trade it. Uh, the, so the, there must be some kind of platforms, liquidity. That, that I think is the first, uh, let's say, the textbook approach to, okay, when there's something in asset class, now it ticks most boxes. It's... It's, it's highly volatile, but it, yeah, so, 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 so that is, that is, that is one thing. The second, of course, and this is also where the fund that I launched came from is that I was from, I think from the great financial crisis on, but this got more and more. And of course, also with, with COVID, the, the way that central banks and governments work 
when there's a crisis, so that, that's first, but then later, uh, after that crisis, that there was no way back. And this is, uh, of course, about the enormous amounts of debt issuance, first used entirely, or it seemed to be entirely to, to, to combat a crisis and then helped by a central bank by lowering interest rates and so on and so on. But then you saw that this, the budget deficits and relatively low interest rates uh, continued even in, let's say, peaceful times, uh, positive GDP growth times. And that made me study a bit how our growth model works. And, and you can, it's very easy to demonstrate that uh, because of aging, our eco economic mo model is a debt-driven model. We need ever more debt to continue growing. Now, then, of course, the question is, why should we co continue to grow? Now, so, so this is also something that I, I, so if you look at a politician, he or she will always say, I promise growth. I want us to grow. A CEO of a company will always say, I want to see profit growth. We, uh, when we look at our bank accounts or our salaries, we want growth. So we are addicted to growth. We cannot realize this anymore uh, in a traditional way uh, with, with a, a, a labor force that grows. Uh, so for example, in Japan, China, and Germany, the labor force is set to decline. In China, it's likely already declining, but we won't give up on the concept of growth. So we have this magical ingredient called debt, and debt made me think, okay, but now, then we get this whole discussion about debt sustainability. And once you go down that road, you immediately end up in the discussion, what is actually behind our debt? What is behind yeah, our yeah, money? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. When, when once you do that, again, I'm a pragmatist, then you have to go back to the end of the gold standard, the, the uh, things like that. And so then, then this question is for me as a very traditional investor with all his investments originally in a bank account or a broker account, no questions asked. And I started asking questions. I'm, I'm not really fan of this idea of ever more debt and money with nothing behind it eh? so only trust and that's that's i think a very legit question when you you see what happened with all the debt the levels of debt the the, the budget deficits in good times and things like that so that then it's it's an analysis of how did we use money in the past and and should we go back that is basically where it starts yeah, yeah. well it, it it's even the question, what is money? What I, what I found interesting is, yeah, like we are looking for growth all the time, but also now while you're talking, I'm just thinking, but that is nominal growth, right? Like it's a plus X percent on, on a chart. And then we say, okay, this is, this is great, right? Or prices are up or wages are up, but that's all nominal. Yeah. It doesn't say anything about the, the, the value. And in a, de a debt based monetary system, we create more units of the currency that we use and therefore we devalue the existing or the, the units that already existed. And like, I don't come from an economic or, or finance background, but I'm, I'm a pragmatist as well. And I think, you know, when I ran into this, I was like, okay, I also want to know like how this works. And I, I knew price was not value, but just this entire logic, it, it just doesn't make sense to me. It's not logic. It, it's just not rational. Right. And, and as you said, like, what does, what, what is the debt backed by? And I once had a discussion with, with a gentleman and he said, the debt is backed by the promise of the people paying it back. And then I thought, but, yeah, the next but, generation. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, well, yes, that's the, that's the real answer, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, the next generation, not within the lifetime of the person who took yeah. on the debt, right? But it's just so, I almost want to say like superficial. The explanations are superficial for something yeah. that is like deeply entrenched in the entire money system yeah. and, and, yeah. and, and the connections within the world. Right. And so that really triggered me to dive deeper into that because these explanations just weren't sufficient. Does your Bitcoin custody setup keep you up at night? Gain peace of mind with OnRamp and their multi-institution custody solution. OnRamp creates a dedicated multi-signature vault for you and three separate institutions each hold a key, which are OnRamp, Bitco, and CoinCover. But none of them can move funds unilaterally, only you have control. These institutions can only sign with your instruction. OnRamp's multi-institution custody eliminates single points of failure, reduces your personal attack service and technical burden, and provides access to financial services that allow you to secure your Bitcoin, including inheritance planning, insurance-backed warranties for all balances and transactions, low-cost trading, and more. 
Check out onrampbitcoin.com through my link in the description below and receive $250 in Bitcoin when you join. Yeah. So I think this is a very good point uh, because in, in traditional finance, but when I go on LinkedIn or X saying something about debt in general, uh, debt on balance sheets, there are always the same people who say, but Jeroen, debt is by definition an asset on someone's balance sheet, which theoretically is right. Uh, yeah. But the next question, what is never asked, and I, you, you say something similar, where is the willingness? Who is willing to hold that debt? So, and then you don't With have the to trust have, that it will come back, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah but, and, but from an investor perspective, it, it, I think you can even erase this whole trust, the next generation issue. You can also say, I have an asset on my balance sheet that used to be high income, low risk. And when you look at the characteristics, so, so I look at data on my balance sheet, I now have an asset class that bonds that have le- relatively low yields, negative real yields. And also the relative volatility of that asset class is rising compared to, for example, equities. So when I'm in, if I'm a risk manager, I'm a risk manager. I, my only goal is to have the balance between the asset side and the liability side. So on the asset side, something happens. I have to adjust. So, and this is also, if you're a long, long only investor, it's even more straightforward. Why should I add this asset class that gives me not what I'm promised? And this is the whole 60, 40 equity bonds thinking. So yeah. once you add the, the willingness, the, the, the question, who wants to hold it? And you then look at central bank's balance sheet and there is your answer. Uh, nobody wants to hold it or not that money uh, many people want to hold it unless uh, the interest rates spike uh, or double uh, instantly, for example, which is not possible because of all the debt to the system. But I think whenever you are capable asking the question, because by definition, it will be on someone's balance sheet. That is true. But but yeah. it, it does matter. China doesn't want it. Will pension funds want it? Do central banks want it? They have to. And so I think when, once you answer that question, then it gets interesting. And how do you say that? Then you go down the rabbit hole. That's, that's, that's why I think that that also for an in very simple investor like me is less appealing because of its characteristics. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it makes so much rational sense to me, but I still am pretty much baffled by how this system currently works, right? Because as you said, who wants to hold the debt? You know, then for example, in our country, we have pension funds who are also kind of forced to buy treasuries, not only from our own country, right? But also from the States. Um, I actually had a nice experiment. Um, so by the way, they are forced, right? And and it's in, in America, they call it the, these unfunded liabilities, right? So on paper, my mother is getting XYZ pension, et cetera, right? But, but that is what is promised to her. If that's really there, yeah. you know, we don't, we don't really know. But I actually had a, a nice experiment. I contacted her, her pension fund. She kind of consolidated everything in one place. And I, uh, I looked at their reports and I saw like they have like uh, US treasuries and et cetera. But the only percentages, like amounts, not the rates. So I just contacted them on Twitter. I'm like, I want to move half a million <laughs> in the pension fund over to you. I see you have this, these amounts, right? But I want to know the rates. Could you tell me the rates and the duration? And the answer was no. Mm. And I thought, okay, that's interesting. Yeah. You know, for yeah, me, that's yeah. a signal <laughs> yeah. that, that yeah, they yeah. don't say it, right? And yeah, it's just, I don't know. I don't, I don't I'm, I'm, I'm not there yet. I also don't think you know, but, but why, why does the system work like this, right? Because my, only logical conclusion is it's manufactured, right? The 6040, as you mentioned, like it's, it's kind of a way to, to trickle down the, the devaluating money from its origin and, and the people that benefit from it first to, well, pension funds, individual investors, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. This is a difficult question. And so, and pension funds are even more complicated because they also have a liability side that is dependent on the same assets. So if they go down on the one side and then on the other, medically it should hurt less. You know, this relates to a question that I'm researching and not even, I think, the good word, but I'm, I'm getting increasingly questioned by the whole concept of focusing on 2% inflation. And so why, why do we have 2% inflation? I have two small children. If I know that prices are stable for the rest of my life, would I spend less now? Perhaps even in the transition phase for a couple of months, because this is not something that you are used to. 
Hey, we are yeah. focused on the two percent. But would I would my spending be different? I cannot imagine. And even if there's deflation, and uh, there are books written about the impact of technology on our society, which is by definition deflationary. So, yeah. so, so, so you. The, the question is, of course, why do we always have to hollow out our money? And yeah. There is, you can argue that this is because we are a debt driven society and inflation and debt. These the two are, these go along very, very well. If you are a big debtor, you need inflation to, to, to inflate yeah. that away. I do not have a clear answer for your question. Uh, why we have this system. The only thing is that at some point we lost the ability, or we did not want to because it was not practical, to exchange things that were actual value, like gold coins, for example. And so we, we lost that, and then it was basically about trust in the financial system, in the institutions, in the way central banks work. But I also, I, I find it interesting, I'm, I'm more of in the area of asking questions myself here, but what I find, for example, interesting, if you look at the inflation target of the Bank of Japan, it's nearly identical to that of the United States. But the characteristics of these economies, their debt mm -hmm. loads, they're, well, they're totally different. Why, do, why does a central bank that has realized a 0.3% inflation since the year 2000, 0 0.3, still have an inflation target of 2%? That's, that's crazy. So that, 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 is, that is... And then you look at the amount of debt Japan has compared to the rest of the world, and it kind of answers your question. Eh? So, so I don't... I, I don't know. I think this obsession with growth that we talked earlier about, but not being able to realize growth in a natural manner is what got us into this financial yeah. system, which is based on trust and could, could stay for very long, a while longer. And there's also a way to restore trust. Eh? So that, that is another thing. But I think this is the basics of why we are here. And, and it looks like it looks now. This is my half answer. Yeah. No, I think, I think it's a great, an sorry, I think it's a great answer. Well, I, I think Bitcoiners would give you a slightly darker answer, I, I, I would course. say, right? Like <laughs> yeah. the, the, this, yeah. this, uh, well, I think you mentioned the book or the book that you refer to is perhaps the one by Jeff Booth, like The Price of Tomorrow, yeah. where he yeah. talks one, about, one of them. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Also that as, as a person who is not an economist, but more a technologist, like that makes so much sense, right? And I would agree, like, I don't think human needs will change even in a deflationary economy right so if i'm hungry i buy a bread today i don't wait for tomorrow to feed myself right if i need a car or this or that and i think actually in in a deflationary economy innovation would in a way be how they say like incent incentivized because you want to make things better i think that's the entire goal of humans is to make progress make things better be more efficient right and i'm not sure if you read the book by lynn alden broken money but she has of course. this video about it right where she talks yeah. about it and you see like these she has like an illustration of like a blob which is prices going down you know like deflation it's shooting at that but we are we are measuring all the technological advancements in a currency that is inflating right so these are like two forces that are fighting with each other and i always use kind of the example of why was a bread you know 30 cents in 1960 and now it's four euros you know, that doesn't make sense. Like in my mind, a bread should perhaps even be free right now, right? Like why, yeah. why we should be more efficient in making bread, right? Or, you know, same goes for an apple, like the energy needed to grow an apple did not go up, right? So the, the apple is still an apple 50, 60 years apart, but the, the way we measure its value, the unit, you know, we need more units of that because they were devalued. And yeah, I, just in general, this is a really interesting topic. I think in mainly also, you know, in the space that you're in, I think this is the the problem that people need to understand, right? Like most people don't, they, they feel prices rising and people talk about inflation, et cetera, but yeah. they don't really understand wh what is behind that. No, no. And and also the, the even inflation itself is a very strange definition eh? because central banks always talk about price changes. This is the only thing that they talk about, and they have yes. several definitions, but never about the price level. Right? So so there was this, I think it was the head economist of the ECB that said, we, we, we must start cutting rates uh, because we must not risk falling in the, let's say, post-Great Recession era when inflation was continuously below target. So everybody that looks at their wallet or at price levels 
that has, and and this is something it is also interesting even though you can so gdp growth is a is a change uh, level eh? so so that that you at some point look at changes in 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 measures but for a lot of people that do not understand what central banks are doing and i think there are more and more of it uh, because i can sometimes not really understand what they are doing as well um, so so yes i i think this whole concept of inflation is very confusing but we are raised with the idea that two percent inflation in this case an arbitrary target is good this is also why i think what you have seen with central banks is that we have seen negative interest rates eh? so you were punished for having money at your bank you were actually punished this this is a, is a very strange concept because i can remember our central bank chief but also others and they are very f- fond of being being safer which is definitely not a good thing to do by the way but exactly. so, so, yeah. so we had we had negative interest rates if you look at japan again we had a reinvention of yield curve control eh, because it was there, there before when there was a war going on it was definitely not the case this time so i also think that people are naive when they say yeah but this two percent inflation target that will stay forever so i think most likely at some point it will go up because that is if you if you agree and this is a big discussion but for me it's very clear if you agree that debt sustainability is an implicit slash explicit part of a central bank t- target then inflation higher inflation is a very easy way out to realize debt sustainability or or postpone uh, debt yeah, sustainability becoming an issue yeah that's like a pure gaslighting in a sense right that, i mean that, that's like moving the goalpost because the, yeah. the system that you're trying to keep together do, doesn't doesn't yeah. work, but yeah. they yeah. Will, they will never say that. <laughs> no, 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 and that's also yeah. because they never will say something about debt sustainability. Even though, yeah, for mm-hmm. example, the ECB we had the capital key ratios. Yeah? So, so you, the ECB would buy bonds relative to the size of the assets or, or 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 deposits or reserves of the different central banks. Right? They completely left that. Then some some journalist or some people like me said something about it and then they created a new tool too which is entirely black box where the, the boss of the ECB said I'm not ge- going to give you all the details because it will raise questions this is actually what she happened uh, what she said yeah. yeah so so I think that people should not be naive to think that there is a possibility that the inflation target will go from two to three even though technology would say it have to go from two to one right so exactly I yeah. do not I do not rule this out and this is Again, a very important part of why launching a fund that invests in scarce assets, I the, the the odds are not zero. Yes, yeah. So okay, you 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 went down this part of the rabbit hole. You're studying it. This Bitcoin thing came along. I thought it was interesting actually when you just said you know when when possibly a new asset comes along, you should in uh, you should look into it. But I would assume this is also your first time in your life that you're really experiencing like the monetization of, of this totally new asset class like i'm i'm personally not familiar but maybe if you are please let me know but right like this it's a totally new thing it's in this monetization phase so people are figuring out well how do you value this what price do you put it on etc combined with that there's this 24 7 365 market so you know the volatility is, is is all over the place but you still decided to study it you even have a fun now are are you an outlier like uh, where where do you think the tra- <laughs> TradFi space is with regards to their attitude towards, you know, understanding the significance of Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so when you look at traditional finance, I am I am very lonely. I'm re- truly very lonely. So it's either you are a gold bug or a Bitcoin maximalist on the one side, or you are a I don't I don't I see career risk here. I don't want to change my sixty forty distribution money making model here i have i have a lot of people doing strategic asset allocation mean price optimizations but i don't really want to change something um so when i launched it fund and this is a good question on on how i felt i am literally in the middle of those two things and the big the big question mark was will there be any appetite for that guy from the traditional going somewhere in the middle because that's actually now that that turned out pretty well i can say and now what i am watching so i think i'm i I don't feel lonely but i am still pretty uh, it's pretty new what i do like is all of these and i and i i I track these and i i save these for example two 
US state pension funds adding uh, Bitcoin ETF and spot ETFs to their uh, portfolio. One of them is a highly renowned, uh, innovative, but uh, not uh, Nobel Cowboys investment committee, yeah, so to say. The, these are not these are not amateurs, so to say. You had Michael Burry he already sold it, uh, but he bought for a while. He bought gold, uh, things like that. You are, there are so many of these news. Uh, flashes, even though compared to how many news items you see about NVIDIA, for example, it's still, uh, but, but this is th thinking it, the, the traditional finance world is definitely moving in the right direction, what I call my direction, but it's extremely slow. And this is because the, there are committees, there are things, there's an age gap between who makes the decision uh, and who gets to provide input, but not decision making. There's, of course, the whole money making, the fee structures, uh, the, the way things are constructed. So I think that a lot of people would like to move faster, but because either their career, their business model, or the way they are raised in the in industry, let's, let's put it like that, that it's so, and you, and you also see that whenever there is a period of, for example, Bitcoin going down in price, that, uh, that immediately slows the, the whole adaptation change thing. Eh? So so this is also why I call this whole, whole thing the, the great rebalancing. And that is an evolution, not a revolution. And that, is, that is, I think, that I'm very much from the evolution, but it's extremely slow. And evolution is also slow. Eh? So I mm -hmm. can see that almost every day to who I talk to. I had a discussion just earlier with people that are very in the traditional fund making, fund distribution industry, slow. The word is slow. Wow. And so what type of feedback are you, are you, are you getting on, on the proposition of your fund where, where Bitcoin is a core asset? You mean in the traditional industry? Because mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, or from your former colleagues or. Yeah. So, so th this is, so the, the official statements. So I, whenever I do a presentation, doesn't matter to what kind of potential clients or, or public or, or, or listeners. The, the concept of my whole scarce investing team is never laughed at, for example. So this is, this is rubbish. This doesn't make sense. And then you get the first thing is the official responses. Yes, but custody, cost, uh, career things. How do we, should we do that? So then it's the, the need to implement feels like it's very, very low. Then you have the actual people that have their own thoughts as, and, and they are, I think, a significant percentage of those people in their heads is definitely way further. And so, so they are either at home doing uh, in their private investments, doing things like that. Um, and then there's a small group that actually tries to reform their companies or to have a niche product added to the total palette of, of universal solutions. And so, so what is being said officially is different, is very much different from what is said unofficially. Again, this is for me a confirmation that the, the trend is heading in the right direction. But yeah, you need to, so, so that is also my simple idea. Every day, one investor, one traditional investor will wake up, look at the charts, look at my charts and say, yeah, why, why don't we do a very tiny step? in that direction of scarce asset to gold and Bitcoin or crypto even eh? So, so th this is, this is, this is what I feel is happening, uh, yeah. both in the Netherlands as, as um, in other parts of the world. I don't, I don't see a very big difference. There. Yeah. Yeah. I eventually, you know, the, the journey that you just shared that you went through, you know, even, you know, especially with a background in traditional finance, you know, like yeah. really doing your own research and just being triggered in a certain way um, that made you go down, you know, well, the list of questions that you mentioned, that you mentioned, like, I, I, I really think that, of course, I focus on Bitcoin, right? But it's kind of like this individual mind virus, like once you start asking these questions that are not even about, well, what I think is the solution, which is Bitcoin, you are already educating yourself on getting on the road to perhaps, you know, even studying Bitcoin. So this entire work that you have to do before you even get there, you know, I think that's just an 
individual journey. You cannot, you know, that's not a company workshop where you just drop a bomb and, and say like, you know, <laughs> you should question everything that we taught you. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, like yeah. That, that, that's not going to happen. But yeah, I, yeah, and I think it's interesting. So I see it like that as well, right? So something like a pension fund is of course not like a one unity thing. It's just all these several, several people. And I think, you know, even a story in BlackRock, uh, with, with BlackRock where you see, you know, Larry Fink was a huge skeptic. And now when you hear him talk, you're like, okay, he, he gets it. But, you know, he got educated by a way younger guy who started working at BlackRock, who, whose goal it was to start a Bitcoin ETF, right? And I, I don't know how long it took him, but, you know, that, that is yeah. just eventually how, how it goes, I think. Yeah. Yeah. This is, I, I also think that a lot of people should not underestimate. This is also something that I'm looking at now, the whole concept of gener generational wealth. Eh? So this is a, I don't know how many trillions it were. I, I don't know the number out of my head. But if you look at my clients, they have all ages, but a lot of the, let's say, older investors definitely have been educated, as you mentioned, as you call it, uh, by their children, by someone in their in their surroundings, in their network. So, so you see, I think this is a somewhat younger people driven uh, trend, which is, which is adopted by a lot of other investors all over the place. Uh, and, but I, and I also, and, and when I then read about the amount of the in, in the uh, a massive amount of money that is going to switch from 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 grandparents to par to parents to children this i don't know but it feels very logical to expect that there will be at least more attention for these new asset classes and so so you don't have to uh, have the entire end idea of the end goal in mind uh, as, as mentioned before if you look at hardcore realized bond data and you compare to that uh, with, with 20 years ago it looks way less attractive now if you also mm -hmm. include a bit of forward looking if, if you dare to do it a, a lot of traditional finance they, they built their whole strategic asset allocation on, on historical data only which is by definition somewhat dangerous Interesting. Uh, but, yeah. but if you if you add a little bit of forward looking and, and this is a very objective view to implement uh, how much money is going to younger people and how do younger people look at, for example, let's take the example of Bitcoin. Now you see you have these pie charts showing 10% in favor, 25% in favor. Yeah, you see how this works. So add one and one together. And it's pretty obvious that, that this is getting more and not less attention uh, apart from what regulation is going to do and central banks and governments. But I, I think it's very out there it's it, it's obvious for everyone to see so yeah why yeah. not act on that yeah i agree i mean from my traditional finance days i remember the entire sc scenario planning right uh, yeah i think it's just fascinating that these a lot of big traditional finance companies seem like to not really do that i mean your point exactly i mean this is why this is called bitcoin for millennials you know the, the millennials are going to inherit all the all the wealth and the the game that they think they should play with investing etc right like what their parents or grandparents did yeah that it's not even attainable anymore right whether it's it's it's, it's like long term you know smp or uh, real estate or or whatever and i fully agree like it's it's definitely on the radar of millennials and i would say even more on the radar of you know generation the ge generation below that yeah um, yeah sure which yeah. is also you know, they are both generations that are way more informed about all the other alternatives, right? So they are less susceptible to, you know, I'm your bank and this is what you should invest in. They'll be yeah. like, no, I'll, I'll, I'll rather, I'd rather do my own research. And, you know, it's going to be way harder for these traditional institutions to convince this younger generation to actually just be like, you know, okay, you'll, you'll manage my wealth. I think, yeah. I think that will change. So when you, when you talk to potential investors for your fund, like how, you know, I can imagine these are like family offices, stuff like that, that are probably not well versed in what Bitcoin is or how it's not crypto and stuff like that. Like what, what is your pitch for Bitcoin with regards to why it's, it's a core in your fund? Yeah. So again, if we focus on traditional investors, I, I take a serious amount of time of my whole presentation, depends on how long I get, of course, to talk about gold first and there are a couple of reasons for that somehow i think 90 percent of all investors have some feeling with the concept of the value of gold uh, let's keep it let's keep it simple even the investors that say yeah but gold has no cash flows 
they, they, even they say, okay, there is something about gold that we accept as being an asset class and, and, and representation of, of, uh, value. Now, then you can educate them a little bit, but by having the whole discussion of this 6,000 years of means of exchange. And then we got central banks and these central banks had 60, 60% of their balance sheet was in gold. And, uh, and then, and then, and then we left that whole. Uh, concept. Now, my, my, my idea is very uh, simple. Then I uh, try to explain that suppose that let's, let's start with gold first. Suppose that the price of gold doubles overnight. You wake up tomorrow and, 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 and that means that for every dollar of debt, there's now twice as much as gold. This is also why debt sustainability can be, become more imbalanced if this happens. If the, the one thing that rises in relative value that we agree upon represents value wins relative to debt that does not have, have intrinsic value, right? So that's one thing. Now, and then you start, and then I think with Bitcoin, there are a couple of things. The first is very straightforward in the sense that everything that we own, have, do is digital. Yeah? Uh, so, so what can you imagine would be my question that we have some kind of digital form of gold. Yeah? So, so that we agree that there is something valuable we all accept because that in the end is the question. Do you accept it as, as, as that valuable asset? And then most of these traditional investors understand the whole concept of everything being dig digital. They understand then the having a scarce asset. Then you talk about a little bit of scarce assets and then. Then there are two things. The first is a little bit, many people understand it. This is the whole, and this is also what uh, Lynn Alden talks about. Eh? This is the settlement. When we exchange something, preferably you would like to have some tiny piece of gold going from one end to the other end, from your bank to my bank. What, what, that in, in, in a sense, should be, and then, then you have 100% trust in that there's value being exchanged, uh, right? Of course, we don't do that. And for gold, that is yeah. very impractical. So... But it also, so the settlement of an actual transaction takes time because it is a physical and it has to travel all over the world. Now, once you say you can have the transaction and the settlement at the same time with this technology that is behind Bitcoin, then people also tend to agree on that. And then from that part, then you have to do the whole trust thing that it is a new kind of trust and there there it goes wrong so that even there's no trust yeah that, now so so l l let me elaborate on that because i think there's a very enormous good example of this so a lot of people first of all this has to do with bitcoin having a track record of let's say 15 years right against those six thousand that, that's something but then you know yoval harari the writer of the book sapiens so mm -hmm. that book was great right and he ends with uh, people becoming more and more digital now you Probably you have seen it. He made a video where he called Bitcoin the currency of distrust. And this is exactly how traditional investors look at Bitcoin, the currency yeah. of distrust. Whereas I see blockchain and not going to, into the technicals, I'm not good enough to do that, but I see blockchain as a, another form of trust. So I go to my, my bank, there's, there's someone there and I believe that my money will be there. That is mine that I can pay with it everywhere and that tomorrow it will be uh, worth exact the same. Eh? You talked about these breads, eh? so I can buy the same amount of breads. Now, this is the whole thing. I, you want to verify that is also... So, so for me, blockchain is just another... It's a technology-driven way of creating trust. But for a lot of people, and Harari is a good example, they see this as distrust. It's an example of distrust. And yeah. there is where mar most of the... And then the whole, this is going to be a store of value like digital gold then it, there it ends. So that for them is the, the hurdle they cannot go over at this point in time. Yeah, very interesting because I think that that video of Harari, I think that is fully flawed yeah. because, yeah, he says it's, it's, it's a currency of distrust, but the, the point is that you first have to admit that if yeah. you are forced to trust a third party to verify your asset, how... How will you assert their promise that they will do that in the right way? And I mean, yeah. you know, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I am not into gold, but for example, my example for gold is, you know, if someone says I have, uh, you know, X amount of gold in my safe, yeah, if, if I cannot look at it and weigh it, you know, put it on the scale myself and see it, yeah, then that kind of like abstracts the level of trust, right? And then people say, well, but you have official institutions like, you know, 
you know, and they say, well, this amount of gold was traded or people hold this amount of this and this. Well, but okay, but who are they governed by? Right. And for me, that's the entire thing. Like that, it's not about that. That is a bad thing. It's about that what Bitcoin brings is a way to verify for yourself without any third party. If, you know, your Bitcoin is real. That's also funny because there's no Bitcoin, right? Uh, <laughs> where, no, no, where no, the Bitcoin no, sure. is, like all the, all these things, right? Yeah. And so I think it's more about accepting that it is better if you're not forced to trust people that of which the trust you cannot even verify, right? Like it's just that it's not about people being bad or evil or whatever. It's right. more saying like, Hey, there's a technology that can actually yeah. do that right now. Yeah. 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 So that, that is for me then in that area, verification and trust are, are aligned eh? because some will qualify this as ver ver verifying others as trust. But again, yeah. it, that's actually, and so when people look at their bank account, they, they no questions asked. Exactly. And, and, yes. and, and, and that is not a bad thing, but if you can do the same for Bitcoin, but then using a technology, then it's equally good or bad. But somehow mm -hmm. people, when you do it with a, a blockchain or when you do it with a technology or a, a measure that we are not used to, or if we talk to a person in the case of a politician, somebody that is known to lie in your face, sometimes we do trust it. And I think that is strange. So why not take all this discussion out and, and, and you can trust whoever you want. That's your, that's your opinion. But they see this as two different mm -hmm. kinds of trust with one better than the other. And, and this is strange because as you mentioned, not good or bad, theoretically, they should be equal. It's a, it's a different way. But, but for a lot of people, that I think is difficult to grasp. But the interesting, of course, is with Harari is that he, in the end of the book, he talks so much about how technology is going to impact our brains and things like that. So that it would be very sensible for him to agree that there will be some kind of technology technology driven trust or verification however you want to call it so that is that is i find this so interesting but this is mostly this is why we are talking about this so for so long this is an issue for a lot of people mm -hmm. it's it's yep. not tangible even though i i feel my bitcoin is tangible i cannot touch 100%. it 100 yeah. yeah and uh, no, uh, i, I yeah. agree i think this is also again jeff booth who talks about you know this is the paradigm shift like the people they look at this this new thing, you know, and if what Bitcoin establishes this trustlessness, uh, a monetary network that's trustlessness, which means yeah. not doesn't mean you cannot trust it. It means you don't have to trust other participants in that monetary network. Yeah. That is such a paradigm shift compared to what we are in now. And the people uh, commenting on it, as, as you described, they look at it from inside their own yeah. paradigm without understanding that they are in a paradigm or, or what the construct of the paradigm yeah, is right yeah, so yeah, you you it's yeah. it's not it's not their fault but i think yeah that's the thought exercise eventually that you have to get through and i think what is nice with bitcoin is that you can actually prove that promise that trustlessness promise right because that's the entire point the entire yeah. almost value proposition of bitcoin is yeah, I, I am just a protocol, a set of rules that anyone can adopt and use, and you can verify this for yourself and you don't have to rely on anyone yeah. else, yeah. basically. Yeah. 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 yeah it's I think you describe it better than I do, uh, but that's also, this is your daily job and not mine. But yeah, I think this, this is it. Uh, so that paradigm shift, also the ability to, to look at different paradigms and understanding, maybe not having the same view, but understanding them. Exactly. I think that is a yeah. big, big problem yeah. for a lot of people. Yeah. And I think what usually helps me when I talk to people, so, so maybe this also helps for you, I just ask questions. So if someone would say like, yeah, but I trust, I don't know, this uh, gold verification, something, something service, or I trust my bank or whatever. Yeah, yeah. You just ask why, you know, like, can you reason that for yourself? Because the yeah. number in your banking app is literally a number in a database shown yeah, to yeah, you, yeah. right? Yeah, 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 and yeah, yeah. <laughs> so if you then just ask questions, you don't even have to pitch Bitcoin, right? But just ask questions like, okay, but where does this understanding yeah. come from? Yeah. You know, Agreed. and then yeah, yeah, yeah. they will, they will, they will have an error somewhere because they probably never really thought about it. And I think that's an interesting, just, you know, intellectual conversation that you can then have. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah. So do you think, of course, you you worked at Robeco. Do you think, uh, and, and in America, we, you mentioned the pension funds. Like, do you think pension funds should actually also adopt Bitcoin? I mean, they have been forced to buy, you know, these bonds, treasuries, all the, all these things. There are all these promises on paper, which are getting increasingly insecure. You know, generally they are very risk averse, but I personally see Bitcoin as 
the lowest risk asset that you could own. I think you would disagree with the price going up and down, but that's a different perception. But yeah, what, what are your thoughts on that? Now, yeah, so why you should add volatility? Because even though there are a lot of different schemes how to do that, have it uh, a pension at some point, at some point you have to buy your pension. And and this means that if your value on the day is just 20% higher or lower than the day before, yeah, so, so you can smooth all of these things, yeah, but the, the harder your fixed exit point is, the more prone you are to volatility. Yeah? So if you if you can say, oh, this is not a good day, I can I, I, I'll look again tomorrow uh, or next month or next year, then 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 this whole volatility issue becomes less. And the second is why volatility for me is important is that it says something about the quality of your return, and this has to do perhaps not with the, in the so suppose that every volatility breakout or spike does not change the end point of the return of an asset class, okay? Then then for people who are agnostic, risk agnostic, they, they don't care. But true life is that most, especially retail investors, make stupid decisions when they are pressured by volatility. So this is also, so when your quality, quality of your return, you have less of these moments. So, uh, and, and when I was at my previous employer, when, when things were really going down and my colleagues and I sat together and we say, okay, this is perhaps a good time to start slowly accumulating into things. Every single day, retail clients, but also other clients went out uh, and lost. Then they were too late to get in. They were, they were scared and they never got in. And so this is why volatility because of the endpoints and the way that you get somewhere and, and what that does to your, to your investment behavior. That is, that is, I think, very important. Another thing I want to say from the pension fund side, I do not have to clear NCF because they also have this little liability side, but, but conceptually, we have this life cycle investing when it comes to pension funds. If you are, have an old age personnel, then your asset mix is different from then and then everybody in your company is 20 years old right so so this means that but what we do and there are a lot of 401k life cycle funds developed for that the, the general concept is also for long only is you start with a lot of equities and you end with a lot of bonds but again i look at hard data i don't need a very doom and gloom scenario that some countries going to default, but the realized volatility of bonds relative to those equities and other asset classes is rising. So does that make my fixed point? And that's also why I started there. So if you end with bonds, but they are structurally more volatile, you have a bigger risk when your end point is one day, yeah, to make it very, uh, that, that, that that was happening. 2022 was an excellent example. We got a 20% drawdown in those safe bonds. So my question is to, to pension funds, as for every other investor that does something with a strategic asset allocation, is ending up with 80% bonds. Is that actually a good strategy? Yeah. If you then have to buy your pension or your boat or your, bring your children to college or whatever. So this, and then in the end, you come to my same point that you can rethink that asset class, that uh, asset mix, sorry. And then of course you have to, uh, look for alternatives now and my simple answer is yes you should ask bitcoin because i believe in scarce assets and this is it's like the same story all over again but yeah. you should look for alternatives in my world when something is extremely abundant which is debt and bonds and they cause volatility you should look and you look, look up in the dictionary i say this every time the, the opposite of abundance is scarcity so this is this is my idea so i'm i'm wondering now even that the Risk return and diversification, hard realized data is much less attractive than it was 20 years ago. At what point will pension funds, but other endowments, the clever investors, whatever, say, I should not end up with 80% bonds when I am very close to that point that I have to buy my pension, that boat, and, the, and there you go again. So yeah. this is interesting. Once you accept that this is a legit question, you have to find those alternatives. And for me, there's your question, that is gold and Bitcoin, that can be something else. But this is interesting what happens because if those pension funds do that, these are massively large. Then you have true outflows out of bonds and inflows into other stuff. Yeah, I think this is the exact opposite of what we previously uh, discussed uh, as to to like the, the, the challenge of, of thinking, right? 
because if you end up with 80% bonds, like that, bonds and treasuries are the ultimate form in my, you know, non-econ, non-finance background opinion of trusting. You're blindly trusting that yeah, yeah. this country yeah, that you get that. these bonds yeah. and treasuries from, that they're yeah. fisc- fiscally responsible, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. I mean, you know, if, if you look at the debt in America, like the, and again, your, your point about forward looking, right? Are they ever going to pay that 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 back? Like, is there going to be any real return? I think that's that's a that's an important yeah, term. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Then y- you are basically doing the opposite of what you are kind of you know pretending to be doing when you are asking yeah. or thinking that Bitcoin is you know an antitrust something something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think and and to make it clearer. If I may, that uh, you can, from your angle, I think it's a very good point. You can better invest in a thousand different stocks that are in some index. Uh, and then even though they are also have uh, levered up in some cases, of course, then having 80% of, of uh, Italian bonds, haven't uh, US Treasury, exactly. a special yes. stage. But yes. that's also the case. I think these discussions that I discussed before is always about US Treasuries being such a fine asset. But what about Italian bonds? And they behave like, like almost like junk bonds because they mm-hmm. probably are. So they're being so held yes, up, so, so right? Did, yeah. 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 And, yeah. Th- and this is also why I believe that people understand this now or even willing to learn about this story will say, I want to start investing for my pension in, now okay, I say zero bonds, but in less bonds. And I do not want to end up with 80% bonds. If it's 30, yeah. then it's fine or 25, but not 80. Let me have some of the other flavors that are out there and not only equities. So yes, this is, this is all what I call the great rebalancing. And this is yeah. why this is going to take decades. And this is fine because I have the time. Yeah, so I'm 46. There's time left. And so yeah. that, this is, this, this, I find it a so, because I was so close to that world, an intriguing question. Do you really want to end with 80% in bonds? I think the answer will be no. Well, m- my mind goes like this. I think, well, oh, sidestep. I once read, I think, Austria had like a hundred year bond. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 50 a or hundred year, which yeah. already is down like 60% or more. I think they have recovered. Uh, so, yeah. Okay, yeah, well, the, yeah. that, well, anyway, it's not, it, it's lower than the promise, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and, and also, you know, let's say Italian bonds, they, you know, that's probably the worst, one of the worst to have in, in the EU. They are being held up by the European Central Bank, right? By creating okay. more debt, by devaluing then more of the existing currency. So eventually, you know, let's say you were in Italian bonds and it actually gave you the return in nominal terms, right? Yeah. And you have that money. I see your face. How much is it? <laughs> I'm looking it up. So it's uh, trading at uh, 78 cents uh, against 100. I think it was issued. Okay, well, so so it went, yeah, but also the volatility. It went up to 250 and mm-hmm. now it's at 78. So I'm looking okay. this up uh, at my Bloomberg. After how many discussion. years? When, when yeah, was this was long, issued? Uh, uh, 2017. Okay. Yeah. yeah but, yeah. you know, so let's say, you know, the, the Italian bonds are backed by the ECB uh, creating more debt right so then eventually maybe nominally nominally you you get paid your return but if, if, if the question is is that a real return so you know you could have a plus x percent in 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 currency units right but is yeah, that a yeah. real return versus the value or the or the debasement of the currency you know i don't know the answer but i would assume not so and i yeah. find this fascinating i mean you're an you're you're a veteran i'm a rookie in this case i think like I, I cannot imagine that I personally figured that out, that that is just not a good thing. You know, I, I, you know, I don't know. Like that's, that's pretty mind blowing to me, to be honest. But yeah, maybe yeah, it's yeah. also no, because, I, I don't know, I asked these questions without having the, the other background that maybe, you know, kind of yeah. b- blurs that the, questioning. The, this is a good question. And of course, the, the funny thing is we talk about, I, 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 I pulled them in on purpose, of course, the Italian bonds, because we now had Draghi wanting to make Europe great again using yeah. common issued bonds, right? Yeah, so, well. so yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, but all these are examples that debt sustainability is a very clear target of central banks, even though it's not in their official mandates, targets, goals. And so, so yeah, all of these things add up that we want to keep growing. We need more debt to do that. The debt is also distributed unevenly because in the Netherlands, it's 43% of your GDP and in Italy it's 140% of your GDP. So yes, 
of course. And Germany has already said, we're not going to do this, uh, Mr. Draghi. Yeah. You, you had your fund in 2011. Go away. Uh, and so, Italy so, loves yeah, it. Uh, Italy yeah, loves yeah, the of plan. Course. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, the, the ECB, of course, this is the, the, the most interesting example. The monetary policy will be 90% focused on the weakest link that is in the Eurozone. Mm-hmm. And this now is yeah. Italy because uh, Greece is smaller and also they, they have dealt, dealt with them to 2030, 50, I don't know. But, but you will see that monetary policy will be focused on, on Italy. And, and this is, of course, and of course, it's also ironic that an Italian guy is pulling for Euro. No, that's <laughs> perfectly <laughs> logical, of course. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. No, just, uh, I, I find these things so interesting. I read this whole piece and it's so... It, yeah, it's, I love this. Yeah, yeah. This has been my most like eye-opening part of my personal Bitcoin journey. Like once I started going into this route, I was like... Oh, yeah. Okay, this is I'm, I'm, my conviction grows. Yeah, um, me too. Me too. Because that, at one point is, yeah. you, yeah, you you can just functionally understand why Bitcoin works. And I think, by the way, you know, there's there's different levels of dimensions as to you know how you could describe that. So obviously, I'm going through that. But but understanding this, which is the problem for which this is a solution, not to solve the problem, but to basically just ignore this entire problem and, and create yeah. this new parallel system, right? Yeah, yeah it's been not, really, really I tell you, bonds are a great asset on your balance sheet. End of discussion. <laughs> okay, well, okay, Christine. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. I, I, I love it when, I, I don't know who said that, but at one point I learned, you know, economics is not, it's not a science, right? Like it's a no. social study. It's, yeah. it's how people interact with each other, right? Yeah, yeah. And then if I hear Christine Lagarde on, you know, some pressers say like, oh, we have to tame the beast of inflation. I think like, what, yeah. Yeah. who, who are you even talking to? You know, yeah. like, I don't know, like the common man would not even watch this presser. So no. I don't even know who you're trying to like deceive here or something yeah. because yeah. I, I cannot use another word, but it's just like the monster of inflation. Like it do- doesn't come from your policy, right? Like it's all engineered. So it's, yeah. I don't know, like that's just my rational mind that just gets an error. And I think like, you know, it, this, you know <laughs> you're, you're talking the nonsense. <laughs> okay. yeah. yeah, we talked about raising debts. I think, you know, what you're currently seeing, especially in the US, you know, we, we, in general, people talk a lot about the US because that's like the best of the worst uh, currency, currencies in the world, yeah, right? Most, but most liquid, yeah. et cetera. You see these treasury auctions not going that well. I think, I'm not sure if it's getting worse, but they're, they're not, they're not really a success. Like, what is your outlook on the sustainability of the US dollar as like reserve currency, uh, you know, with, with bricks coming up, et cetera, and this, you know, interest payments are higher than the national defense budget. Every time that happens, you know, yeah, you know, states of power collapse. So yeah, what's your, what's your idea around that? Well, my, my basic idea is that, how, how do you call it? That the dollar is the cleanest shirt in the dirty laundry. I think that is uh, what is often used. And that is because of most of our transactions, even though in Asia it's going down pretty significantly, are done with dollars so even the euro the yen the british pound in so, in the end they are linked to the whole dollar system and so that that means uh, and if you don't look at the eurozone again this is of course also flawed by design so so that euro can never never win of the uh, us dollar so so i think that the us dollar is likely the one to go down last i'm nuancing that a little bit with what is happening with the BRICS. that I also have a feeling, an understanding, a, a a warm response to the what is gold, the gold recycling theory, right? So, of course, China yuan trading in Asia is 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 getting larger. But what what you see is that when central banks uh, and other financial institutions get yuan on their balance sheets, they immediately switch it to either dollars. But if they don't want dollars, and some of them don't, they switch to gold, right? So, so I think that ho- the whole gold story, and at some point maybe they could switch to Bitcoin. Uh, I don't think that China will do that anytime soon. Uh, but so these two things, whenever the gold recycling theory wins of the cleanest shirt in the dirty laundry, then then also the dollar is pressured. But my idea, general idea, is we go to through the dollar first, and then to something else. Uh, and in the meanwhile, BRICS will try to leave the dollar for what it is. They will try to have their own currencies, perhaps backed by something like gold, all these initiatives. Eh? But but as far as I can see now, 
yeah, the, the dollar will remain. And that also means that the leeway for the U.S. government to have these budget deficits is much bigger than for a country like Italy, who does not even, uh, which has, does not have, have its own currency. It's stuck in this eurozone <laughs> with its currency. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. so, so I think if you look at the design things and the, so, but, but I do find that other parts had these bricks want to get away from the dollar, but their own currencies are not reserve currencies enough to fill that gap. Even the one, that is not the case. Eh? So everybody, yeah. yeah, yeah, we're going to trade in yuan, but we're going to sell the one as fast as we can for gold or, or dollars. Now, and, and th- this is some, something, and even there, if, if gold becomes more important, again, this whole scarce assets thing would be great. But yeah, my idea is that the dollar will be around for quite, quite some time. Yeah. It's interesting because f- thoughts around this have kind of like, I'd say, reinvoked my idea of Bitcoin perhaps becoming the the world reserve currency. And I'll, I'll, I'll explain why. Like I was big on that before and then I was like, no, you know, this is too much. But I'd say, you know, the, the entire team of decentralization, by the way, we're seeing everywhere also with AI and productivity, stuff like that. But this falling apart of this, you know, dollar hegemony. Also, I think Europe will be in quite a squeeze having to decide, you know, what are we going to trade in? Because they, if they are going to be forced to trade in dollars, you know, I think that's a that's an interesting catch-22. But on the other side, let's say, you know, products from China saying, well, we'd rather have euros than dollars. I think also interesting, yeah, yeah. A, a interesting situation, right? But I mean, the the, the, it, the world is so global, right? So let's say it all falls apart in these different blocks, like monetary blocks, right? You have dollar, euro, yeah. and then you yeah, know, yeah. bricks, whatever it's going to be. They still need to trade with each other. I think that need doesn't change. I think it would be very dangerous for the West if the BRICS would just do everything by themselves. I think that's also still a possibility, right? But if you want to keep, you know, buying a Mercedes cars from from Germany and send them to to Asia somewhere, like you have to do that in some way. And so they still have to, even though they don't like each other, they should still be able to trust each other if they want to do global trade. And well, we we mentioned the trustlessness of Bitcoin. I think in that case, Bitcoin would be a perfect tool to still enable that, right? So even if a, a BRICS block wouldn't want to touch dollars, you know, in any way, they could still trade with America in 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 a more trustlessness way. And so, you know, I think it's just interesting thing to follow to see where that goes because, uh, yeah, none of their currencies are strong enough to lead also this 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 block alone, yeah. right? So they would have yeah. to come up with a currency or use something that is existent, which is not the dollar, obviously. So no. I don't know. It's, it's, I, I think, uh, I, I think that's just an interesting kind of like topic to, to, to keep looking at. So I'm also looking at the time. I wanted to ask you some roundup questions also for the audience. You know, as I mentioned, of course, this is for millennials. And I think we, you know, I focus on exploring what is currently happening? Why is Bitcoin interesting? Why do I think Bitcoin is the most interesting thing you you should study, right? To build, grow, keep your wealth, you know, do whatever you want, build a family, build a company, uh, you know, anything towards the future. And of course, given your unique perspective on both like traditional assets and this these new asset classes, what what are like the most significant opportunities and challenges that millennials face, you think, like in the coming, let's say, decade in general you mean with investing or Mm -hmm. yeah investing um, i don't know if they face that many challenges eh? so the the first thing would be but that is for every age group please do not keep your money at the bank and not because you have to believe that your bank will be gone tomorrow but doing nothing with your money is is purchasing power loss guaranteed. I don't know why people that do. So that will be always my first question. Start as early as possible. Compounding is a massively influential factor. If you if you keep investing for 20 years, that will help you a lot uh, 20 or 30 uh, year later. That would be, the, the. I don't know, perhaps they have less challenges because they are not raised in a scenario where you get two asset classes with one that is not functioning. Let's keep it like that. So maybe they are more open-minded mm-hmm. in uh, seeking those asset classes that make sense, that, that do think, that have some scarce elements. So I don't know if they face challenges, also because I think that the whole idea of having equity capital, so stocks and a part of the potential uh, 
uh, profits of a company in, in the form of dividends and things like that is not going to break anytime soon because we have this growth obsession. So I, I don't know, maybe they have a very, maybe they have a more neutral stance on things because uh, they look at your YouTube channel and others. And then therefore, earlier than those older investors choose the right asset allocation or, or the right combination of assets. So mm -hmm. I don't know if that if that is a bad thing uh, because I also changed. So so these challenges apart from socially and do you get a house? I, I'm very, I have two children, the, the, the oldest is eight, so it's not my worry, big worry yet, but when they go to college, so, so there are a lot of issues I can, but for investing, I think maybe the, the odds are better balanced for them at the starting point. So. So yeah. yeah, yeah, interesting point. Actually, I think I think you are right. I think my side note to that would be, and, and I mentioned that before, and I, I speak to so many people who exper have experienced the same. It's more so we most people are not investing or have this career like you, but their entire concept or idea. Oh, well, they still think saving is a thing. You know, you alluded yeah, to yeah, that yeah. before, but also you know just the entire concept of. I need to invest, you know, it's funny, yeah. like, yes, you need to invest because you cannot save anymore. Maybe that's the, you know, that's, that's one problem that you could look at, yeah. but what they have been told is the way to invest, you know, either 30 year ETF, something, something, or real estate or whatever is, is also not attainable in, in many cases anymore, right. Or, or playing that game that's already won by other people and you're just, you know, the subject, the subject of it. I think is also a realistic thing to understand, right? But so, so I would, I, I would agree with you, but I think so they had, they kind of have like this different challenge, right? They have this concept of what they should do, but the reality is they cannot really do that. And that's also something to, to break through. But yeah. Yeah. No, I think I would put that under the, sh you should invest and can you invest then? Eh? But yeah, to make it very commercial, I would say that my fund is trying a good job of helping these people to find the right asset classes, right? Yeah. So, yeah, so I think, but this is about education. I think that is beneath. Yeah, exactly. In, yeah. in the Netherlands and Europe, there's no investing culture, um, uh, perhaps real estate, and this is like a very specific group, but this is something that I have been trying to tell for ages. Yeah? So as long as you, you, you should start investing, and yes, I'm, I'm very happy to tell people why they should do that, and also how that helps you in the long run. Uh, for for questions when you have children when you want to stop working that you may not have yet eh? so to be aware why are you actually doing this so so yeah th th that that is a very uh, clear yeah. thing yeah yeah yeah, yeah. that's a, that's good advice all right last question and i ask everyone the same question which is what is a core belief that you will never let go wow. my core belief is that a solid investment portfolio focuses more on risk than return. So my my strategy was built with the ID. I want to have a volatility that's comparable to the 60-40 portfolio. Most people think about returns and the end returns, not how they get there. But it's for me, it's the risk mitigation that deserves most attention. So my focus, if you start investing, you, you mentioned a, a couple of times the word study, study risk more than return. Return will follow risk. Nice. Well, thanks for sharing and thanks so much for this conversation. I really enjoyed it. I will link to your Twitter, your website, so people can check out what you offer. Cool. And yeah, man, well, hope to see you around somewhere. Yeah, okay. Thanks for having okay. me. Thanks. Cheers. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, also make sure to check out this video right here or go to my page and check out all the episodes of Bitcoin for Millennials. I appreciate your support and hope to see you for another episode. Bye.